Oh, hi. What a lovely day. It's great to have a moment to, to look into God's Word together. Say, I'd like for you to think with me again about one of the post-resurrection uh, events in the life of Jesus as recorded in Luke's Gospel. Uh, and it has to do with uh, how Jesus takes care of our need for understanding. Not just knowledge, but understanding. The passage is found in Luke chapter 24, and I want to begin reading at verse 36 down, oh, not quite to the end of the chapter, but almost. Here's the passage. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be to you. That's the word shalom in uh, Hebrew. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it, because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. What a passage. Man, wouldn't it be great to have Jesus show up in our midst? Well, what would you do if he did? If the risen Christ just suddenly and visibly stepped into here right now with us, <laughs> you know, on that occasion, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors, we're told. I suppose that it was out of fear of the Jews. No wonder they were startled when Jesus came into the room without opening the locked door. So in this, in this, uh, <clears throat> record that Luke gives us, we find another way that Jesus meets his disciples' needs in this post-resurrection experience. Now, Jesus is about the business of meeting our needs back then and today just as well, and it's always amazing how, how he, it doesn't do what we would expect, but he meets the deep need of our hearts and our, uh, and our spirits, of course. The first thing I want you to see with me is that you and I can expect convincing proof. Now, listen, it's one thing to have somebody box you in with something where you have no option. God never does that. But if we want to know truth, truth is available to us, and God makes sure somehow, that each of us has all the proof, all the convincing proof that we actually need. It's true. I need proof. There are things that have been hard for me to believe, and sometimes I hear rumors go around, I want to know. <clears throat> so I have to find a way to get solid evidence, convincing proof so as a foundation of our belief that Jesus is the risen Christ, that he is the Messiah, there has to be something that we can trust. We have a tendency to want to always do it with our physical senses, but you know, sometimes our physical senses get baffled. Have you ever sat in the presence of a magician and watched him do something that you didn't quite understand? I even try to watch his other hand and, and I still get fooled. But on this occasion, Jesus comes to his disciples and he offers tangible proof to their physical senses. I think that he offers stuff to our physical senses, but it has to be in a different way, of course. 
So I read that he showed them his hands and side. Now, you know, his hands had to have nail prints and his side had a spear hole. You'd think that uh, when Jesus' body was glorified that those uh, evidences of the damage would have been taken care of and, and gone, but you know what? They weren't, apparently. And, and Jesus simply says here, he says, touch me and see. Touch me and see. And then he says, a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Okay, so touch it, handle it. Don't just look at it, feel it. And, and that will be the proof that a guy like Thomas needs. And of course, the rest of the disciples needed some kind of proof all also. So we read <clears throat> that their emotions respond, but <laughs> their minds. I mean, I mean, wait, wait, wait. This is unbelievable. And oh, I saw him die. I watched him be buried. So the comment that Luke includes is, while they still did not believe it, because of joy and amazement. Now, that just means that your emotions are going wild, but your mind hasn't settled the issue yet. Now, you know, there have been a few times in my life where I, I think I've experienced that kind of thing, and, and um, <clears throat> it, it's a confusing moment to go through. The fact is that what was happening before their very eyes was just too good to be true. So, <clears throat> you and I, like them, need to allow God to give us understanding, not just proof, but and not just evidence, but something else, something deeper than that, something that settles the issue in our minds and our hearts and maybe even at the spirit level. So <clears throat> Jesus started with a reference to the scriptures. Isn't that interesting? I'm just reading a book about um, um, Genesis, first 11 chapters of Genesis, and, and the author talks about how the sin was to believe the wrong voice. And you and I have to listen to the scriptures. One of them is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And Jesus talks about hear, and he admonishes us to hear his word. And it's not just a, a hearing in the sense of um, knowing something or memorizing something. It's, it's listening up, taking it seriously. He said to them, This is what I told you while I, I still with you. Everything must be fulfilled. And then, and then he goes back to the Old Testament, which was the Bible he used. He talks about what was written in the Law of Moses, in the Prophets, and in the Book of Psalms. It's amazing the detail about exactly what was going to happen with the crucifixion in those three areas, the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms. The Apostle Paul said, faith comes from hearing the message what's the message? You know, when Jesus comes on the scene, John says he was Logos, the Word. He's the message. And the message is heard through the Word of Christ. Okay, the Scripture was spoken by him, and, and he, that's the written Word, but he is the Word made flesh. And so, Paul talks about hearing the Word of Christ. That's an interesting concept. I've learned that Scripture is powerful. I love the Bible. I love to study it. I love to see the detail and the grammar sometimes, the words specifically, the context. It's just amazing to me how, how much of a revelation there is. But you know, by itself, the Bible sometimes isn't quite enough. Oh, I've shown people what the Bible says, not in my copy, but even in theirs. And sometimes they scratch their heads and go away and and maybe they need to think about it for a while. Maybe they actually need the Holy Spirit to enlighten them a bit. And so on this occasion, we read that Jesus opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. 
Man, you can't believe how many times I have talked to people who knew the scriptures. They even had them memorized, but they didn't understand them. You see, there's a difference between knowing and understanding. There's a difference between facts and uh, perception, the kind where we, um, where we see it for what it really is and believe it in a way that we act upon it. This is, this is frankly not just a process, but it actually is a miracle of God's grace. God has to do something in us to help us understand. And Jesus points out specific facts in Scripture. He's standing there before them. The resurrection is real. And he documents it by saying, this was foretold long ago by Moses the prophets and and the hymns that David wrote called the book of Psalms. Christ will suffer. Now, I just threw a couple of places here on a slide. In Psalm 22, verse 6, for instance, man, that is precise. Psalm 22 is a hymn that Jesus started singing from the cross, and everybody would have known that hymn. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It wasn't that the Father had abandoned him. He started singing a hymn, and everybody could pick it up because of one of the first songs that everybody memorized. And then Isaiah 53 is crystal clear, specifically verse 3. So there you have the Psalms and one of the prophets. And then in the book of Jonah, we have this thing about three days in the belly, three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. And Jesus had said that as Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights, so the Son of Man would be in the bowels of the earth three, three days and three nights. The book of Job is interesting. Job says that he's convinced that even though his body is destroyed and decayed, that God will not leave him in the grave. And there's an insight there. There's, there's hope there. That is exactly what is fulfilled in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I read also a little later on that <clears throat> the result is to, is to be that repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in the name of the Messiah to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. Now, when it talks about all nations, it's all, uh, the word is actually goim, the, the Gentiles. It will be preached to the Gentiles. Man, that's where you and I probably come in. I don't know what your background is, but mine, I'm a Gentile. And, uh, <clears throat> and I have received the gospel and it has transformed me. Now, with all of that, once we grasp the truth, we have an assignment. And the assignment is, we are to be witnesses of these things. We need to go tell somebody that this is fact, this is truth. Now, I can't take somebody back to the grave in the exact spot. I've been there a few times, and I have taken a number of people to the garden tomb, and I, I prefer that over some of the other sites that are proposed. But as soon as you and I understand that Jesus really did raise from the dead, and we believe that he is the Messiah, we're commissioned then to be his witnesses. Because you see, that understanding is transformative. It changes us. It makes us live differently. It makes our character different. Each of us must come to that point, the point of knowing, understanding by a miracle of God's grace before we can go to work, any other kind of work expounding the scriptures, whatever it might be. Now, the book of Acts is a record. It's the story of how effective the witness of the disciples was. Man, they went all over Jerusalem. One of them went over to Samaria, and before long, the apostle Paul, as, as he calls himself an apostle, is going to the Gentiles <clears throat> now all over Europe. And it affects everybody and everything, ultimately. Now, think about it. You and I have to come face to face with a fact that needs to change us. And it's going to take something, um, a process deep down inside of us by which we are given understanding. Not just knowledge, not just an experience, but what here is called understanding. But once we have it, we have to act accordingly. 
Sometimes, you and I try to satisfy our doubts with more study. We try to do it with uh, some kind of research or uh, maybe even get into some kind of chemistry and physics and all of this. But Jesus wants to come to us, if necessary, at the point of our senses. He told Thomas, okay, you believe because you saw and felt it. Blessed are those who don't have to see and feel it and still come to a point of believing. Well, what a deal. What, <clears throat> what we may need is to let the risen Christ come to us personally and open our minds so that we also can understand. Now, the opening of our mind is, that, have you ever heard of somebody having a, a closed mind? Well, that, that's the opposite of an open mind. And sometimes an open mind can only be accomplished by Jesus Christ himself when he comes to us and gives us the kind of proof that we need, but gives us that miracle that only he can give of understanding as well. Then, then we'll know him. We'll know him for who he really is, the Messiah of God, the risen Christ. And we will be witnesses to the fact of the resurrection. The resurrection miracle isn't just that he rose from the dead back there, but the real, the real miracle is that he gives you and me resurrection life, and you and I come alive spiritually as well. That's the real miracle, and that needs to be proclaimed to everybody, and we need to be witnesses of it. You can't be a good witness unless it's transforming you, unless it's making a difference in your life. But you know, that's exactly what it does when Jesus gives us understanding. Pray with me, would you? Father, thanks for the fact that it isn't vague. It isn't just some kind of hocus pocus or uh, some kind of a mystical thing that we have to believe. It, this is real. And we you know, you, you have offered us the proof that will not only convince us, but give us understanding. And I, I realize it takes a miracle of your grace, and so I ask that that miracle of understanding will become real right now with the listener, as it has for me. And I thank you that you're still at work today, just like you were that day when you met with your disciples after the resurrection. And I thank you for what you're doing in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.